Welcome to the Soul Seeker Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Cabert, and this year marks the fifth birthday of the Soul Seeker Podcast. I started this pod back in 2019 when I was taking my first steps on the path of remembering. And at the time, the tagline for the show was a journey of self discovery. A year later, it became a journey of remembering. Yet, what I know now is back then I was still seeking. And what I've come to know now is that it's the journey of seeking that brings us the silent, slow stillness of acceptance. And therein lies our own innate wisdom. It's my mission now to eradicate the glorification of hustle culture, as it was my drive in entrepreneurship that led to a greater whole. And that's because I was outsourcing my sovereignty rather than looking within. So let this be your invitation to take a deep breath in and remember that at any time we can shift our thoughts and our feelings to create the outer world in which we wish to live. Soul Seekers, it's time to grow. Let's go. Soul Seeker Podcast here with Tim Grimes. I am so, so excited and maybe even too excited that I manifested some chaos going into this podcast with some technical issues, but so grateful to have uh, Tim on the podcast here and him being flexible as well to manage through those uh, those technical just issues. Before we get started, I introduce Tim. Just if you guys are listening and you're not in a place of you're driving or doing something else and you want to join us with some breath, we're just going to take a couple of breaths here and I invite you to as well. And if you're driving, just keep your eyes open. You can still breathe, right? Or doing anything like that. So Tim and listeners, let's get into it. Just finding a comfortable seat, closing down the eyes, keeping them open if you're driving, obviously and beginning to deepen the breath. And finding an inhale through the nose, slowly inhaling all the way up. Sipping in a bit more air at the top. And through the mouth, audible sigh. Another like that, slow inhale through the nose, all the way up. Sipping in a bit more at the top. Rolling back the eyes. Holding the breath. And exhaling, letting it go. And one last breath, inhaling all the way up. Biggest inhale yet. Sipping in a bit more at the top, holding, rolling back the eyes, and through the mouth, audible sigh, let it go. Flickering the eyes back open, and let's get this podcast started. Tim, welcome to the show. How are you feeling? I'm feeling good, Sam. (laughs) <laughs> I feel like our energy is way better now versus the frantic of like joining on Zoom from my iPhone and be like, yeah, my computer, my setup's not working and all this, like, let's just reschedule. And then 10 minutes later, be like, okay, I got it to work. And you'd be like, you sure? And I'm like, yeah, we'll just slow down. We'll breathe through it and we'll be good. We're both here now. So thank you for being flexible. Of course. Yeah. And I mean, I was, I was kidding that, you know, it was an auspicious sign with we were having technical difficulties and that's, you know, that's La Vida. You know, you got you got to go through the technical difficulties to get to the other side. So here here we are. Here we yeah. are embracing it all. I love it. So just for context for the listeners, I got into Neville Goddard's work, who is a spiritual teacher from, I guess we could say the early 1900s. I'll defer to Tim. And somehow I came across Tim's book, Relax More and Try Less, and a few other ones as well. And this was after working with an energy worker. His name's Peter Evans, but a lot of uh, my friends that have gone and seen him, we just affectionately refer to him as the wizard. And my integration of this energy work with this real life wizard was just 
synchronistically coming across Tim's work of this book, Relax More and Try Less, Relax More, comma, Try Less. And that book changed my life. You know, I'd say for about four or six weeks, I maintained a very, very, very high frequency. And then some things in life happened and I bounced out of it. And now it's like, you know, coming in back and to the reminders. Um, but that said, I've shared this book with so many people. So I'm just so honored to have you here, Tim, on the pod. I'd love for you to introduce yourself to the audience for people that aren't familiar with your work. Sure. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me, Sam. And thank you for those kind of words. Um, I, I love love it when I, I, I hear people reading Relax More, Try Less, because that book is it's 10 years old now, just about, or nine years old. Um, yeah, my name's Tim Grimes, and I am a coach and spiritual counselor. I've always been interested in uh, alternative stress management. And it's, you know, kind of the connection with spirituality. Uh, and I've written a lot about it. And I've, at this point, I've coached a lot of people and counseled people on how to integrate, uh, you could say kind of far out law of attraction, manifesting type of concepts, the kind that Neville Goddard, who, yeah, you're you're right. He was like he was basically a mid twentieth century uh, mystic teacher. Um, some of the far out stuff that he talks about, how to practically implement it in our lives. Because especially the last couple of years, I've I've kind of started to focus more on grounding people into these you know various manifesting ideas because we hear so much about manifesting these days, uh, and it's such a popular topic on social media. However, I don't think most people actually implement it in a fulfilling way where they don't judge themselves for doing something wrong or they think that, oh, I'm not doing this technique right or I'm not in a high enough frequency. There's something wrong with me. I really try to emphasize the uh, relaxed, non-judgment, your life gets better just by easing into these ideas more and embracing them more and focusing more on relaxation. And uh, that's, yeah, that's what I, I share through the written word, through the pen. And uh, I, have, I have a podcast as well called Law of Attraction Explored and um, also a, a, a ton of informal car videos of, of me uh, on YouTube. So yeah, that's, that's what I'm about in a nutshell. Car videos, huh? Yeah, good old car vids. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Cool. So how many books have you written at this point? Believe it or not, I've lost count. Um, that many, I, huh? Yeah. Well, so I originally, I got into Neville uh, back in 2014. And at that point, his teachings were, were well known, but not nearly to the extent that they are today. So I edited quite a few of his lectures and his shorter books. Um you know, in, into 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 collections and put them on Amazon, and I was encouraged to write commentary about some of his works because there wasn't really a lot of commentary about Neville's teachings uh, back around 2015, and so that's how Relax More Try Less came about. And I wrote two other short guides about Neville, and I've written. I'm trying to think. Most of my books are short. You know, uh, they're like a hundred pages or less a lot of the time. Um, I like that about it. Yeah. Yeah. So I try to be really succinct. I've written um, several other short guides since then, but like uh, three other full length books, I think, since mm -hmm. that time. So I've, I've written, I think, like six full length books um, and I've edited, you know, a lot of Neville stuff. And there's another great law of attraction teacher that uh, maybe we'll talk about. Maybe we won't. His name's Emil Kue. I edited a collection of his work called Simple Self Healing. Mm. He uh, he's a he's a real good guy to to know about if you're interested in the law of attraction because he really grounds these ideas in uh, practical psychology that I think most people can understand. Yeah, let's just go there now because I, I definitely want to dive into the relax more, try less, and Neville teachings. Um, so we'll definitely get there. But now that you mentioned this other person, what? What was their name? And can you tell us a little bit more about them? Sure. Yeah. So Emile Coué was a French psychologist uh, from the early part of the 20th century. He he was like thriving in like the 19 teens and 20s. And believe it or not, he was he was 
extremely well known um, during like around 1920. Uh, he was compared in some circles in terms of popularity to Freud, believe it or not. He was mm. he was a, a well known figure. Uh, and what he he's famous for a couple of things, but largely forgotten today. One of the things he's famous for is he's considered kind of like the grandfather of explaining the placebo effect. Um, he basically he would his his job for decades was as a pharmacist. He had a pharmacy and he realized that when he prescribed something and said basically, oh, this is gonna work well, or this is gonna, this is gonna, you know, help cure you. It had a much greater effect when he said nothing, or if he said like, oh, this might work, this might not work. And he uh, got into hypnotism and kind of combined a lot of ideas about self-hypnosis with this idea of uh, positive expectation. And that led to him basically uh, treating thousands of people each year and having them hypnotize themselves to get themselves better, to heal themselves of their ailments. What's very interesting about Kuwe, because I could go on talking about him, and I have a bunch of car videos talking about him. Uh, what's interesting about Kuwe is that he was he didn't use any spiritual language at all. He said, this is just a part of being human, is we have these psychological tools that we often misuse, but our imagination is meant to work alongside our willpower to keep us healthy and to heal us and to make us accomplish goals which rationally might not even seem possible. So Kua was very down to earth. And what's impressive is that people would come see him and a large percentage of those people would be able to heal themselves very, you know, relatively quickly and effectively just by implementing his very simple suggestions. His most, fa his most famous line, his most famous, I guess you could say technique is this thing he called conscious auto suggestion, where you would, you know, you put yourself in a rather drowsy state before bed and say every day in every way, I'm getting better and better. And you would re recite that like a mantra over and over again. Um, but yeah, he's just, he was an incredible teacher and he's sadly uh, forgotten about, except if in certain psychological circles. Uh, so people have heard the name, but they don't actually grasp the profundity of what he's saying. He hugely influenced Neville and most of these more spiritual sounding uh, law of attraction teachers that came after him. So thank you for sharing that. So it's every day I'm getting better and better. And essentially like what we're hearing with Dr. Joe Dispenza and uh, other teachers as well, getting in the theta brainwave state and reprogramming subconscious mind, right? Yes. I mean, it, basically the stuff that, that Dr. Joe is talking about and that so many of these people today are talking about is stuff that Kue explained extremely clear, clearly a hundred years ago. And when I said this, th when I say this guy had shocking success rates, I really mean it. it like, you know, pe like if th again, thousands of people would come to see him a year and, you know, over 50% of people the reports, you know, there's been reports saying would heal themselves by going to see him. Now, whether those were long-term cures, you know, that's up for debate. You can debate that about most of this stuff when we're talking about the law of attraction. But I've just never heard of success rates like the kind that Kuwait had in modern times, um, at least in the Western world, when it comes to, you know, getting people to buy in and effectively implement this advice in a very practical, health-inducing way. So let, thank you. Let's get a, a deep here and talk about uh, disease, specifically something like cancer, right? And I try to be very cognizant and mindful and just respectful of uh, all people's situations, whether it's a physical disease or hardships in life, because, you know, in a lot of ways, if we tell someone that's newer on the path, like, hey, your subconscious mind is creating your reality and quantum physics proves, science proves that your inner world creates your outer world. The spirit of harmony law, the law of attraction, all of these things are saying the same thing. And someone is like, well, how come everyone in my family is dying or, you know, whatever the situation may be, or I'm experiencing X hardship. Uh, so I'm experiencing cancer, whatever it is. What do you say? 
regarding that, like calling those hardships in? I know that's a big question. So no, it takes I, I love it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so this is my take on this, and this ties right into relax more, try less. I think that there is an incredible amount of, you know, we in, in the law of attraction community, we call it lack, lackful thinking, um, lackful, ne- you could say negative input going into our lives every day. Cu- you know, and we could say that's culture. We could say that's just humanity itself. But in the very least, culturally, the input in many ways is largely negative and lackful. And you could say diseaseful, not just physical disease, but mental disease, mental suffering. That's the default. That for almost everybody is going to be what you were raised in. So I don't care how well versed you are in like the law of attraction or all these ideas we're talking about. It can be hard to overcome that degree of indoctrination and that degree of cultural input. That's the work, you know? And so I I have a very forgiving um, viewpoint with it where I do think, you know, hypothetically, most diseases can be cured via our imagination. You know, know, Kuwe always said, if it's at all natural, it can happen, you know? And he he always had that caveat and he said, you know, we don't really know what what the the endpoint of natural is. You know, there's things that we might think are unnatural that actually are natural. You know, and seeming miracles are are like that. But I do think people in uh, in this, I guess you could say, manifesting space, kind of glaze over the amount of negativity that we're fed every day, and that almost everybody buys into, and that plays into our health mentally and physically, and we're largely unconscious about it. Almost everybody still is, even if we're on this, you know, quote unquote path. It, it's hard not to take in some of these inputs. It takes a lot of inner work to um, say, you know, what, I'm this abundant, healthy being, and I'm relaxing into the abundance and health I am. That you know, my subconscious is you know springing forth naturally from within me. And that's going to cure me and keep me healthy and keep those around me healthy and, you know, and wealthy and, you know, sane. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to practice it. And the practicing part is what interests me a lot more and why I like working with people one-on-one as opposed to the theory. Because the theory uh, is wonderful, but it's, uh, it's harder to walk the walk, I think, for almost everybody. And too many people in the manifesting space don't acknowledge that so much to unpack here so practice in theory i love that you know in 2023 i feel like for many people uh, on the path was extremely challenging not everyone but a lot of us collectively felt that and i was uh not immune to that uh, it was definitely the most challenging year in my life and Also, it sent deeper uh, layers of healing, right? And that's really what got me into all this subconscious mind type stuff um, because I've been on the path intentionally for about five years and it's just not something I've gone deep on. And it's just like, I remember a mentor of mine uh, saying something about the subconscious mind, like, why is no one talking about this? Like, this is, this is it. And I go, that's funny you say that because I'm just coming across this too. So of course you're the messenger of of that because now it's in my awareness. Now it's right. The whole thing Um, that said, where am I going with that? Basically that the theory and the practice, is that what you said? Theory and practice? Yeah. Yeah. So this has been a big thing for me that I'm teaching with my clients and my circles and talking about with friends and whatnot. It's like doing the work, like the shadow work, it doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be dense. And like I've started to adopt this new mindset of like it's game time. I've been learning about uh, all of this in theory and now it's time to put it to use because it's so easy to your point to fall victim and prey to that negative conditioning where it's just like everything's happening to me and why it's so challenging and all of that, right? Whereas if you've been doing the work 
and now you're being faced with, let's just call it dark night of the soul. If we can adopt this mentality of like, it's game time. That's why I've been learning this in theory. Now it's time, in your words, to put it to practice. And that has been instrumental. So it's just awesome to hear you say that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, again, what really interests me about these ideas these days. Um, actually, a, a, another book I wrote a couple of years ago, I think in, uh, I think t- 2021, it's called The Law of Attraction Simplified. Mm. And um, it touches upon what you just said. It just, it's like, okay, we know the theory. Like, the, you know, I wrote that book, like for people who already are, are familiar, they've heard the ideas, they know, they know a lot of the teachers, you know, they don't need any grandiose, eloquent theory in the clouds. They need it like in their living room. You know what I mean? They have to be able to, 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 to do it, to live it. And that means, in my opinion, like you said, the shadow work facing, facing resistance, facing lack, you know, that's, that's the work. Um, and it's fine. Like that's, that's a good thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's nothing to shy away from. That's what this stuff is about. Usually like, it's like, all right, we're going to, we're going to face, you know, we're going to, we're going to face the resistance. We're going to look at it. You know, Joseph Murphy, the, you know, the author of uh, the power of your subconscious mind, who's a great, you know, a great law of attraction teacher and a contemporary Neville, you know, he's got that, that great story in that book where he talks about, you know, he gives the metaphor of like the, the boogeyman in the closet. And we're scared, we're scared to open up the door and look at the boogeyman. But all we have to do is look at the boogeyman. That's how the healing happens. We open up the door and look at the boogeyman. You know, we face it. We don't, we don't run away from it. And that's, again, interesting to me. That's interesting. I mean, that's yeah. how we heal, you know? And that's, that's um, in my opinion, what so much of this is about. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And, you know, for me, um, what's been helpful is allowing myself to have a pity party, mm-hmm. you know, and being like, hey, when I'm, when I'm just like not ready to do the work, honoring that and I call it humanings. Shout out to a good friend of mine, Celeste McQueen. Uh, her and I, or maybe she did, come up with this term, but it's basically temporarily, uh, intentionally disengaging from your spiritual or mindful practices to just chill out and be a human and, you know, whatever that looks like for you. And I think that's important because it's so often like we want to be a good spiritual person and lean in and do the work and confront it and be with it and all that. But then other times it's like, hey, just distract and numb yourself temporarily and understand that you're doing that and release guilt and shame because where people where I know I get stuck and I have friends, clients get stuck as well is when we don't allow ourselves to actually numb and distract, but then we do it. And then on a subconscious level, we're guilting and shaming ourselves. Yes. So if we can bring the intentionality to it, and just release that guilt and shame. It's such a huge game changer, you know? And it can be integrated into to other, you know, other brands of spirituality that aren't aren't quite as self-judgmental. And also like psychotherapy, you know, this brings us back to relax more, try less. Like, even though I, that I wrote that book shortly after, bef- shortly after I got into a lot of these ideas, I still feel the same way about most of the things that I said there, like, including exactly what you mean, like, literally relax more that means like do stupid things that numb you sometimes that just make you like like veg out like watch tv you know what i mean like go go have a a couple beers on the porch whatever do whatever like don't be this special holy spiritual person all the time i personally we can get into this or not like i really like i'm very much against that quote-unquote special spiritual person because my background is is not this stuff spiritually. It's more like a Zen background. And, you know, they've got that saying, it's like, you know, if you meet the Buddha on the highway, kill the Buddha. You know, it's like, we should be very reticent of um, teachers that seemingly like are floating above us, you know, because yes. it's just, it's it's mainly in my eyes, like, you know, the term I always liked was spiritual materialism, which was a, you know, like a, American Buddhist term from the 1970s. These days we, we tend to call it, I think, spiritual bypassing. And I just, I see it all the time. And I'm still pretty active in like the Neville community. And it's a huge problem where people want to float, you know, they, they want to idolize Neville or some of these other great teachers. And they are great teachers, 
but they have totally unrealistic expectations of what life is and how to actually look at the boogeyman and face these these you know challenges or the resistance that we all have within us that stuff is there you know and it's uh to to just elevate some a teaching or you know say you know this is my life now and you know i'm i'm immune to all this stuff i think is it's good it's denial at least for everybody i've ever met you know and i've met i've met some pretty interesting people so <laughs> Yeah, I, I totally resonate with that. And for me, what's coming up is like spiritual narcissism, you know, yes. especially right now that it's becoming cool to be spiritual. You know, you get all a lot of celebrities or just people in general. And um, some of my friends even look at it too, or like, you know, you're always just like right before the trend. And I'm like, I don't know, but just so you know, I'm not doing this because it's trendy, you know, and in a lot of ways, it's funny just to be in my mind and be like, before the lockdowns, you know, I got activated, as I like to say, in 2019. And it was right before the, everything changed. And I felt a lot of hopelessness being like, it, being brand new to the spiritual community, being like, yeah, you guys have probably been saying the awakening's happening for you know, your whole life and people have saying forever, like, no, it's not happening. Right. And then there's been like the trippy part of it. Like, oh, wow. Did the world wake up because I woke up? So now it's almost like switching timelines or anything like that. And then getting to other thought forms of being like, I liked this before it was uh, cool and trending and where, you know, it, there wasn't uh, so much uh, spiritual narcissism because for me, I went through a heartbreak, you know, being like, really in this community, you know? So um, I think it'd be fun to kind of hear your thoughts on that for a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I just, I don't know. I'm in, <laughs> I'm in the fray a lot more than I thought it would be at this point in my life. Um, I was very fortunate in the sense where I had some really good buddhist teachers when i was young and um the real spiritual uh breakdowns slash breakthroughs i had i would say were happened when i was a teenager um i wrote a little bit about this in a guide i wrote called the joy of not thinking um but spiritually i feel like a lot of the deepest insights i had were when I was relatively young, like before I was 30. And then I got into uh, this law of attraction stuff, almost from like a practical angle. Cause I was, I was a real estate agent and I was really sick of it. Um, and I found Neville and that was when I was like 32 or 33 years old. Um, and so spiritually I wasn't, I, I dug what Neville said. I dug what a lot of these, new thought people said these law of attraction teachers said but i was never that impressed by it from a spiritual angle it was more like oh this guy neville or these different teachers are teaching me ways to more practically use my thinking and my imagination to help myself and to help others like to, to utilize the goals and rule in my life in a in a practical spiritual way i didn't look at like a lot of these trendy spiritual teachings as being all that profound. And I still don't. The profound stuff, you don't have to worry if you start going down that hole because people ain't going to follow. I mean, like it's, it gets quiet really quickly because the, the deep spiritual teachers, they don't, they're, they don't say, oh, you're going to get the, the house on the hill. You know, they, they say, no, there's nothing to it to any of it you know it's again it's like you see the buddha on the highway they're going to kill the buddha and that uh i don't think people have any interest in talking about that usually i've always had a lot of interest in talking about it um and that's why i don't think people have a lot of interest in talking about it because when i talk about law of attraction stuff what well, people want to talk about because they can mm -hmm. get something mm. but uh we talk about this other thing, life itself, which you could say is like inherently like abundant or inherently like life giving. 
that itself, that aliveness, it's not a concept and it's not marketable. And mm-hmm. I don't think people even, uh, it's something altogether different. It will never be popular unless we have a, unless we have a, some kind of consciousness, consciousness shift. Maybe we will through AI or something else. Like it'll be like 2001, a space odyssey, you know, we'll merge with the machine, merge with the future or whatever. But like right now, I think our spiritual outlook, how people look at spirituality, generally speaking, is not any deeper than it was at any other time of, you know, the last couple thousand years. Yeah, I I hear what you're saying. And for me, what it feels like is like we get to the point of experiencing a spiritual awakening and that's exactly what it is. It's an experience. And at that point, we lose it kind of like what Adyashanti would talk about. It's like, uh, forget how he framed it, but it's like I had it, I lost it type phenomena, you know, and we get these glimpses where we're back in it. And then it's just like, is like that zen zen calmness and it's it really like i don't need all the materialism and all the other things but then something happens where now we're back in the matrix we're back in playing the game we're back into our old conditioning and it's kind of like this yo-yo and it's like an infinity uh, the highs and the lows and different cycles that we're going through because just speaking for myself like i mentioned at the jump of this pod when i came across your book i was probably I said four to six weeks, but probably more like four weeks um, in that total Zen state and manifesting and creating. And I, I truly didn't care. You know, in ter- I don't know if that's the best use of words, but um, when I, I say- love it. It's yeah, actually- yeah. <laughs> yeah. But like, I mean, I'm a business guy, right? And Silicon Valley and all that. And that's what drove me to spirituality was chasing goals, achieving success and feeling more empty and going through a numbing depression. And it's so easy for me to get back into my old ways of being like, oh, I have to do things. I have to do all this. And after I saw the the wizard and was integrating with your book, I was pretty much just like, F it all. I'm not doing any of the stuff. I'm just, and it was around October, which out here in Santa Cruz, like that's pretty warm time of year. It's better than summer, um, early October. So I just go to the beach and not even, you know, maybe a a little bit of meditation, but more just like be in the elements and reflection and contemplation and just like be with it. And that's where I'm stuck right now. I'm trying to get back there because just hearing you speak, it's like, yeah, I resonate with both. You know, it's a yes and because it's so easy to get back caught into the conditioning. So I think my question for you is, a lot of us experience this. What would be some of your recommendations on how to ease into the process of relaxing more and trying less? Because for me, I am someone that works with earth medicines and plant medicines. And, you know, I use them as a tool, not as a crutch. That said, they can really be a great accelerator to get you back into that frequency to integrate it. And it's definitely more challenging without working something external, whether it be plant earth medicines or like this wizard or energy worker. So there you go. There you have it. would love to hear what's coming up for you. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think the first thing is that we want to acknowledge our humanness, you know, what, what was that that your friend and friend and you came up with? What was that term? Humaning. Humaning. Yeah. We, we want to acknowledge, we, we want to be doing some humaning and we want to acknowledge that we're human and that there's nothing wrong with that. At least in my opinion, you know, like in relax more, try less. So, you know, I say, you know, don't, don't try to be perfect. You know, it's like, there's an ambulance outside right now. I don't know if you guys can hear it or not. Like, that's perfect. You know, that's perfect. That's fine. You know, there's a, there's a technical difficulty before we start the show. That's fine. You know, that's being human. And we don't have to, again, aspire to something that doesn't seem aligned, you know, like we don't have to try to, if it doesn't seem aligned to be this like special mystical person, don't go for that. Just be you, right? Because how we can learn to relax more is become more comfortable being ourselves. So, you know, the general gist, the general recommendation is do whatever the heck you can 
that makes you feel more inwardly relaxed. Now, a lot of us have activities we do that are like physically active or like we're maybe engaged with a lot of people even, but like we still have a sense of flow. So if that term flow resonates for you more than relaxed and you like connotate relaxation, like you have to be lying down or meditating or something, just use whatever term works. But think about what activities make you feel more relaxed and then put it a, you know, a priority on doing those kind of activities more often, you know, and alongside that, be okay with, with not feeling relaxed some of the time. Like that's okay. Like you're human. And, you know, the work I do with a lot of people is like facing that uncomfortableness. Like, it's like, oh, like I feel shame because like, I'm not as relaxed or as like carefree as I should be, you know, or I feel, I feel guilty because, you know, I, I shouldn't feel worn out or angry about my day, but I do, or, you know, whatever it may be, or I feel inferior because I don't make as much money as that person, whatever loaded feelings we have, the, you know, uh, approach I like is to look at them. We, this is not dissimilar to looking at the boogeyman in the closet. Cause like we hide away from the shame. We hide away from the anger. We hide away from the fear. We can look at them. And if we look at them and start kind of talking to them, they usually will talk back to us and tell us something. And they will point us in a direction that makes us more at peace with who we are and more capable of relaxing more often. So, I love that. Yeah, yeah, sorry. No, no, that's, so that's the general gist, you know, a practical approach that I like to use. That reminds me of internal family systems, parts work. Totally, absolutely. Yeah. It is IFS. I mean, I use IFS, you know, I use that modality or stuff like that all the time with clients and parts work really works well alongside a lot of these manifesting ideas, really works well. And it's something that a lot of people don't know about. So, so could you just, so it's not me, uh, so we can hear it from you for someone that's not familiar with parts work and, and actually let's get into that for a second. I've been wanting to say, and also, like you said, it's all perfect, right. In terms of like not getting caught up in, Oh, I should have done this or that. Right. And we also don't want to spiritually bypass and it's all perfect, but we, know all this so anyways what i was going to say is the subconscious mind we've kind of danced around it but we haven't really addressed it so it's very confusing and different people have different thoughts about the subconscious yeah. mind and conscious mind but i feel like it's so simple and i feel like i explain it pretty well and i totally resonate with the way you break it down so for someone who's newer to this or they've heard of the subconscious mind but they don't totally quite understand it could you relate it to the masculine, feminine, inner and our world and how you teach it that way? Or just however you want I, I to do it. How I would, so what might be interesting, I can do it that way. But honestly, the way I look at it now to explain it usually, and again, it's, it's a loaded term. I, I think the reason people get confused is they have every right to be confused. What the hell is the subconscious, right? Like, what do we mean? The way Kue, who explained this stuff, again, in my opinion, better than anybody in a clear way, he said, you're unconscious or you're subconscious. He said, for practical purposes, your unconscious and subconscious are the same thing, right? But this is, he went further. He said, your subconscious for practical purposes is just your imagination. Love that. That's like, so that can be very helpful, you know, for people who are very spiritually bent, like myself. I mean, here I am bashing all the spiritual materialism, whatever, like, but like for me, I say like my subconscious is God. It's like, it's like, that's my con connection to the universe to, you could say the creator. I don't know, but like, it's something deep within me, but I think for practical purposes and yeah, Joseph Murphy, if, if you're confused about what the subconscious is, Joseph Murphy gives a bunch of good examples, including a really good masculine feminine example in the power of your subconscious mind, his classic book from the 1960s. But, um, you know, a, a way to look at it is that we have conscious thoughts that we're pretty aware of, right? Mm -hmm. Our subconscious is what's going on in the background. And we're usually not aware of it at all, but it, in a way it's running the show. Or not in a way, I mean, it, it is running the show, which is not to say that your conscious thoughts don't have any strength or value. They have a lot of value. 
But if they're not aligned with your subconscious thoughts, with your with what's in the background, then it's not going to pan out. So for instance, you could consciously be like, you know, people affirm stuff like, you know, I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm a millionaire, you know? And if you don't, if you're broke, your subconscious knows, your imagination knows, no, this guy's got no money. But if you can somehow convince yourself, oh, I'm feeling wealthier and wealthier, like my wealth truly is growing. And you affirm consciously, I'm, I'm getting wealthier and wealthier. And you somehow get your subconscious to buy into that for the background to buy in, which is why we hear all about these various manifesting techniques. That's what they're trying to do is to get your background noise, basically your background subconscious to buy in. If you consciously affirm something or set your sights on something consciously and your background mind buys in, you're, you're in luck. You know, it's not luck. It's your subconscious in action. It's going to start to create that in your outer world. Does that make sense? I can give other examples. Yeah. And is feeling, uh, feeling is the seeker. Is that yours too? That's ne- Neville. That's a famous Neville book. Okay. So that's Neville's. Uh, sometimes yeah. I get you and Neville confused. Yeah. I edited nice. a bunch of his, his yeah. stuff or, you know, put it on Amazon back in 2015, 2016. So that's probably, you can find it. I bet you on my uh, Amazon page, a copy of it. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I love, uh, I have a few of your books. Um, and I love them because they are short and you can keep read or listening to them. I listen on audible. Um, and it just is training my subconscious mind. And what I got to the past couple of days is I'm taking in too much information and it's like, that's my blog right now, because there's like this book I want to listen to this book. I want to read. I'm totally. on my sixth book. I have a few different projects and I'm just it, my my book is called Overcome the Overwhelm. So, of course, I'm experiencing overwhelm. And right, that, right. that is the that, cosmic joke. And, that's and the creative that, the creative process always. You know what I yeah, mean? Right. Yeah, I know. I Yeah, it's so funny. Yeah, so, that's that's one of the hardest things. I, I don't mean to cut you off, but I completely agree with that, Sam. I, I'm glad you mentioned that. <laughs> Which part is that? Just, just there's too much stuff. I mean, that's, no, that's yeah. the phenomenon of social media, you know, like uh, there's so much stuff that's interesting and that we want to take in and it ends up confusing us, even though it's a bunch of good information because there's too many different yeah. viewpoints, it makes it harder to relax and feel inwardly at ease. Yeah. And to that point, there's been multiple medicine ceremonies where at the end of the ceremony, like the big message that came through was we don't need more information. We don't need more books, podcasts, audibles, or anything because that takes away from our own inner knowing and accessing the remembering and to your point, the trying Lex and relaxing more Then the really confusing part of that is like, well, shoot, I'm an author, podcaster, YouTuber, speaker, educator, teacher, you know, I'm like, well, am I adding more clutter and chaos to the noise? And it's like, no, you're guiding people because we all need our guides. And so anyways, that's an interesting rabbit hole. Where I was going to go when I first asked you about feeling is the secret, um, I like to think of things as yin and yang. You know, yin, we can think of the inner world. We can think of it as the archetypal energy of feminine or the 95% subconscious mind. Whereas the yang, we can think of how we experience the world with our five senses, the outer world that is, the archetypal energy of masculine. And and I think I left something else out, but we get the idea, the conscious mind, that's what it is, right? The outer. So to that end, with feeling is the secret, what was such a light bulb for me was I was doing all the masculine things. I was doing all the yang of like, oh, Get in the theta brainwave state, say the affirmation, do the shadow work before you say the affirmation so you can transmute it. But I wasn't feeling it. So Mm -hmm. what I got to, and there was this one time where I was riding my bike home from a hot yoga class. And this is a great story, but I'm not going to tell the whole story. Just some things happen. And I was feeling, I call it awake in the dream, right? Feeling that I amness, we could say it that way. And just feeling connected to nature and all things and everything, right? And at that point, I said the affirmation I had been working with, and it manifested in the next 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. And I, when I went through all of this um, in that four-week period, I've mentioned a few times now, 
that's what was happening. I was just more and more coming to a point of that feeling and then saying the affirmation versus being like, let me get in a theta brainwave state so I can relax into it. Now rewire the neural pathways, which all of that is great, but it's a yes and. It's the yin and the yang. It's the feminine and the masculine. It's the subconscious and the conscious working together. And that for me was just mind blowing. You know, it was just awesome. So. Yeah, it's. I, I think so often the technique is just to get you to that feeling. Mm-hmm. You know, it, Neville, I did a car video recently and Neville's got this great, like like basically a throwaway quote in from some lecture in the mid 60s. Um, and he's like, yeah, all this stuff I talk about and Neville's got like the coolest techniques. Like they're the most far, like they're, they're like, they seem magical. Like a lot of his techniques, uh, just, you know, getting into a sleepy state, imagining something and then like it coming to pass really quickly. He's got all these miraculous stories about that. Uh, but anyway, he's, you know, he's considered a master at explaining all these fancy techniques. And he goes, yeah, all that stuff's just figurative. <laughs> he goes, I'm just doing all that just to convince myself. Mm. Just to get to that feeling. It's all just to get to that feeling. And then if you're in that feeling state and you really, really feel it, you can just have a very light intention or just say it once or what have you. And it, you're so aligned with the feeling, with the actualization that it might demonstrate or manifest very rapidly like it did for you in that situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it's it's the opposite, like uh, like of how we usually look at this. We look at it from this very masculine way, if you want to say that, of like, what do I have to do? What's the technique? I'm going to do all this stuff. I'm going to set this in order to get to the state, and then I'm going to feel it. And it's like, yeah, yeah but feeling is the secret. You really, it's why I mean. <laughs> Yeah. And this perfectly dovetails into the IFS stuff because this is where the gaslighting comes in and it's it's the bouncing in and out because like even for myself, having gone through multiple rounds of this over the past few years, just the one I'm explaining being most recent, um, coming back to the point where I'm at now, kind of gaslighting myself of being like, no, I got to do the things. And, and it's like, whoa, slow down. You know that you don't got to do the things. You got to relax into it because I have that gnosis because I've, I've felt it and it's happened that way. So I'd love to hear from you how you teach parts work and how that, uh, yeah, just go sure. for it. Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, I want to make a disclaimer. I'm not a certified IFS therapist or anything like that. So how I teach IFS, part, how I integrate it with clients is very informally. And I was actually taught it by my, uh, by my therapist who works or t- took some workshops with Richard Schwartz. Richard Schwartz is the founder of IFS. You get, there's a ton of videos, information on it. It's a wonderful modality. The way I use it with clients is the way probably a lot of people use it who are somewhat intuitive. It's basically like, you know, when you feel uncomfortable, we get, we have a person acknowledge they feel uncomfortable about something. They feel ashamed. They feel a lot of times it's fear at first. Like, well, I feel fear. And it's like, all right, well, where's that showing up in your body? Well, like, let's say it's in the chest. Like for me, a lot of times when I feel fearful, it's like in the chest. It's like, okay, let's go there. And now it's like, you know, we just, big Tim is here talking to this part. And so big Tim is, is calm. Right. And this, it can be, you know, we talk to ourselves or if there's a facilitator, they, you know, they're facilitating the, the grown up part talking to this fearful part. And so here I am talking to my fearful part. And I'm just asking the fearful part questions. Basically, like what I would like to ask, but I usually have clients ask themselves, ask their parts is what do you want? What does the part want? And often it's like, well, I want to protect you. Or I don't want you, you know, I don't want you to do this. You say, well, why, why is that? It's because you could get hurt. Oh, well, I haven't gotten hurt before doing this. Is there a reason you think I would get hurt? It's like, well, you know, when you were, you know, nine years old, there was that time where you, you know, you got into that accident and you didn't know what to do. And it's like, that's obviously a very abbreviated version, but what's shocking about that is abbreviated and silly as that might sound. When you actually do it, especially at first for a lot of people, they have these basically revelations within like the first 20 minutes of doing IFS work about some part that they've been scared of or hated. Like, I don't want to feel this fear. You know, it's, it's ruining my life. And within 20 minutes, this fearful part that they've dreaded and, you know, acted negatively towards has told them something important about their life. 
and told them something they can do to change their life to improve it. Uh, that's the the magic of IFS. It's incredible uh, what it can do. That's amazing. Thank you for walking through those extra steps with those prompts and the the thought tracing going a little bit deeper you know, with the layers because that's so helpful. I, I too am a big fan of parts work and, and work with my clients and teach that a lot and am also not certified as a disclaimer as well. Well, Tim, I could keep going. I have a ton of notes here. I'm like, blah, 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 blah. and it's just awesome. Uh, there's so much here to unpack and we are getting to that point of closure here. So I just want to say thank you again for coming on the podcast. Is there anything that you're working on these days that you're really passionate about? You mentioned the car videos. Uh, so I assume that's one of the things for sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm pretty passionate about that. Um, yeah, no, I mean I'm passionate about working with people and coaching people. Um, I I just I love that because we get we get to go deep the way we've gotten to go deep in like the last hour. You know, um, I do have a new book, a relatively new book. It came out at the end of 2023 called Money Your Friend. And uh, in case you can't tell, the book's about money, yeah. and uh, it's it's actually about our relationship with money which ties into a lot of what we just discussed because so many of us have loaded feelings of shame, guilt, uh, fear surrounding money. And so that, that book is very, it's short and it's very practical and it gives you two simple habits you can use for like a month to start shifting your, your general outlook towards money. Um, so yeah, you know, your listeners might be interested in that. And yeah, I've got a podcast, Law of Attraction Explored. It's pretty far out there. Mm -hmm. car, car vids, car vids galore. And um, yeah, if you're serious about, uh, you know, looking at this stuff, I love answering questions. So you can always email me uh, or reach me at uh, radicalcounselor.com. That's my website. Cool. Yeah. And you guys can go to the show notes. You'll have, find all the links there. And if you're cool with it, Tim, I'll, I'll link your email there as well. So people can reach out to you directly. Yeah, I just had to pull up my Audible because I remembered seeing that and I thought that I got it. But the one I just listened to was The Wealth Mindset by Neville. That's yes, that's a great one. That's some great Neville lectures. Jeez, that's a classic. Yeah. Yeah. Money, your friend. I think I'm going to do the Audible for it. I've never done an Audible. Oh, you haven't? No. Oh. Just, yeah. So I, uh, of myself, which is funny because I have a podcast and stuff, but I've never, I've always been too lazy. I've got a great Irish narrator. Um, so I think I'm I'm gonna so that look for the audible version within the next couple of months. It will be out for sure. That's uh, why I didn't get that one. That makes sense. Then you know I I resonate that with, with that man. Um, I wrote my big book Soul, Soul Life Balance uh, two years ago, almost to the date, and I just released the audible like two months ago, yeah. and it was seven hours long that audible. So I will say the nice thing about having shorter books is it's not as hard, but. Like it, I was the same way as you. I'm like, I'm a podcaster. I have to read it. it like I can't hire someone else. Yeah, to exactly. Yeah, right? But I got to tell you, Sam, if this book was 400 pages, I would not, I, I would <laughs> not be doing an audible. <laughs> yeah, man. I, I tell people all the time. I go, honestly, the audible was harder than writing the book. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. It, but you know, it's uh, they hear your voice, which is important. So yeah, I, I do think it's important. And, um, yeah, cool. Amazing, Tim. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day. And thank you guys for listening. We'll see you on the next podcast. Thanks, Thanks Tim. Sam. Thanks, everybody. Bye.